Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome back to The Dark Parade. I am your host, Bo. Uh, we will get to our discussion here in just a moment. Uh, of course, we're starting a new kind of mini-series with Let the Right One In and Let Me In. And the uh, the fantastic Jerry Cortez, a.k.a. Mr. Venom, is joining us for this first conversation about Let the Right One In. As you would expect, he brings uh, a lot of great information to the discussion. He's read the book, which is something that I haven't done because I haven't learned to read yet, but I'm getting around to it. It's one of the things uh, I'm looking forward to doing uh, over the holidays. And so not only does he bring... Uh, a really great knowledge of the film itself to bear in this discussion. But we do get into uh, some of the differences in the book and and uh, some of the surprises in the book. Uh, so it was it was a fantastic conversation. Um, and I think you'll you'll really enjoy it. We'll get to it in just a second. In the meantime, however, worth pointing out this week is kind of a slow week. I'm just coming back from vacation and playing a little bit of catch up on some guest spots that I will be doing uh, in the in the near future. So uh, bear with me. It's going to be a little bit of a thin week around the Dark Parade. But, uh, you know, starting middle of the month, uh, the floodgates are probably going to open back up. So uh, just keep cool, everybody. Everybody stay chilly. And we're going to get uh, a bunch more fun stuff coming your way. But I've been watching nothing but William Friedkin films for a discussion I'm going to do with uh, with Duncan here in the not too distant future. So I think you're going to enjoy that, but it also encompasses like 30 movies. Uh, actually about 24, 23, something like that. It's a lot. And, uh, I'm almost done with it. So as I said, bear with me and, uh, and we'll get to, uh, a lot more fun stuff with dark parade here in, uh, in very, uh, short order. So enough about all of that. Thanks, as always, for listening. Welcome to the Dark Parade. All right, with me yet again is the estimable uh, Jerry Cortez, a.k.a. Mr. Venom. Not it's It's not just Venom to you people. It's Mr. Venom. Yeah, Get exactly. Right. Venom, Venom is my son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. No. Venom's my dad. But, That's what he says. <laughs> uh, uh, greetings and salutations, everyone. Wonderful to be back, Bo. Yeah, so you were here to kick off uh, the, the very first episode. And you yes, have ret- memories. <laughs> oh, 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 those those long two months ago. We were We were such children then. So idealistic back then. Yeah, the, oh, the world was just spread out before us like a patient etherized upon a table, as T.S. Eliot once said. Um, so I, I brought you back because I felt like, uh, one, we had a great time, and two, uh, I need you here for the classics. And we are talking this time about a modern classic, not about Psycho and, and Psycho 2, but um, a, a honest-to-goodness modern masterpiece by most accounts we'll see how we feel about it by the end of the let's not fuck around it's a fantastic movie um but let me ask you to to start with where did you first encounter let the right one in and did you see this before let me in um okay funny fact i have never seen let me in i actually refuse to watch it um okay we, what's funny is we just had a conversation off air about remakes and how I in, in generally don't hate remakes. But the problem is, folks, and you'll you'll learn this about me as we get through this movie, uh, through this episode. This is my favorite vampire movie of all time, bar none. It is a 10 out of 10. It is the 10 10 out of any 10 that's ever 10. I adore <laughs> this movie. Yeah, And there are many, many different reasons, both on the surface and below, for why I love this uh, movie. I have also read the novel, so I'm, um, I'm kind of more... Uh, a lot of the stuff that's left out of the movie that's kind of implied, I remember reading about it in the, in the book. And the book obviously goes into way more detail on Ellie's backstory and everything else. So, you know, once I saw the movie the first time, and I did see it when it was fairly new, uh, I, I believe... 
I don't know if it was in 2008, but at the very least, it would have been in 2009. Uh, I believe this would have been a video store rental at the time. And uh, I just, I think I rented it for a weekend and watched it like four times. This movie struck me, it struck a chord with me instantly. On first watch, I, I was ready to say it was my favorite vampire movie ever. By the second watch, it was, a com it was completely confirmed. And to this day... I still just absolutely adore this film. So, yeah, folks, uh, get ready for, for the next uh, 90 minutes of a love fest here. All right. Uh, I, and I'm glad that you've read the book because I never have. And mm -hmm. much to my chagrin, I haven't. But it's something that I do want to discuss because I know things about the novel, even mm -hmm. though I've never read it. And, and we'll definitely dive into that. So... Um, let, let's kind of jump into the story here, and, and especially because you have this background with the book, don't be afraid to stop me at any point to say, no, 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 th like, here is a difference with the book that the movie does better, doesn't do as well, or just leaves out entirely, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm, I'm actually interested in that. I know, like I said, I know enough about the book to, when I watch Let Me In, there are things mm -hmm. that that references it references some aspects of the novel that let the right one in does not. Mm, okay. And, uh, and I would say let me in feels like it is unnecessary in some ways, but it is beautifully acted and it mm. does change a few minor things enough that it, I feel like it justifies its existence. It's not just like, Hey, stupid Americans will never read <laughs> subtitles. Mm -hmm. there is definitely an element of like, oh no, this is actually exploring some ideas in the, in the book and the original movie in a slightly different way so that it's not just a shot for shot kind of remake, even though at times it is that too, because Matt Reeves, I think is a pretty good filmmaker and kind of understands like, okay, well let's not, <laughs> let's not screw with perfection on some of this mm -hmm. but also because it is set in the united states during the reagan years it sort of uh, uh deals with the idea of external evil in the way that america saw itself during mm -hmm. that time anyway uh, it, it i'm not gonna try to twist your arm to see it but if you ever <laughs> do run across it um it's not as good as this by any stretch but it's very well done. Uh, I may give it a shot someday if I have nothing better to do. I'm also not the biggest Chloe Grace Moretz fan, so that kind of also held me back a little bit. Um, not not to say that she's not a good actress or whatever. I'm just not a big fan of her. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess the, her film projects, a lot of them yeah. just kind of turned me off. And my wife absolutely hates her. So we kind of have a no Chloe Grace Moretz uh, policy here in the house. I, and I, I'm not going to argue that point. But here in this household, sir, we are a very pro Richard Jenkins and Elias Codius household. Ah. And both of them are sublime in it. Uh, Richard yeah, Jenkins in particular is, is quite good. Uh, anyway. Good. So, uh, you'll hear more about that when I talk, uh, mm -hmm. uh, about let me in, in a later episode, but yeah, the, so, um, the movie is obviously somewhat of a coming of age story, uh, it, featuring Oscar, who is a, a 12 year old kid, a uh, very small kid, very frail kid. And, um, we, we sort of meet this character when he's stabbing a tree <laughs> um and you know that is later recontextualized somewhat but i mean it's pretty clear from jump that oscar is not a wholly good kid i mean that's not to say he's bad he's just troubled and yeah. i think that's obvious from jump well, what's funny is that I, I see a lot of myself in Oscar in that I was also bullied when I was younger. You know, I was a fat kid that wore glasses. And, you know, so basically I'm the target for all bullies, uh, especially in junior high school. I'm the same age that Oscar is in this film. And what's funny is that I absolutely um, relate with Oscar's 
obsession, his unhealthy obsession with death. I mean, you see his uh, scrapbook that he has with all the different news articles about murders and everything else that has occurred. And he even talks in class. There, there's that one scene early on where he answers one of the police officer's questions. Um, he obviously has an unhealthy obsession with death. I don't think it necessarily means he wants to kill but he definitely wants to see harm come to the people who are, you know, basically making his life hell. And that's exactly how I was. Like, I didn't want to take a gun to school and blow away every kid who made fun of me. But at the same time, if a truck ran, the, I probably wouldn't cry too much. So, yeah, yeah, I, I totally relate with Oscar in, in many ways, but that one specifically. And so moving into uh, his apartment building is ellie uh along with who when we initially see her we presume that um it's her father but Mm -hmm. it's an older man who are moving into the apartment uh beside oscar Mm -hmm. and um pretty quickly we are introduced to Ellie proper when she, you know, sort of uh, comes out to see what's going on with, with this kid. <laughs> and um, their first interaction is really kind of cold. You know, I mean, the whole movie is evocative <laughs> of, of cold and isolation, but in particular this moment where like she kind of starts off with like hey we can't be friends and uh he's like fine i don't i don't want to be your stupid friend and (laughs) and she's like okay but uh what is that you're messing with and it turns out he's he's got a, a rubik's cube and he uh you know kind of explains to her what it is and how it works and um that it's this kind of puzzle and um ellie is kind of intrigued by this but also oscar is pretty quick to say like oh and also uh you kind of smell weird i love that line you smell funny yeah (laughs) and it's such a it's such an innocent line you know i mean children kind of you know regurgitate what's on their mind constantly they have no internal filter usually a lot younger than this but even as at 12 the fact that oscar just met this girl and instantly says wow you smell funny like that that that's just that, to me that's pure charm i absolutely loved it <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and it it is it's charming and it's also very real and that's one of the things about this movie that i kind of keep going back to is that mm-hmm despite the fantastical nature of what's going on in this movie it feels grounded in very real emotion Mm -hmm. and I think that's what sells the ending otherwise you'd be done Um, (laughs) but uh, and and Oscar also sees the the fact that as soon as they move in Ellie and her father in quotes uh, immediately uh, seal up the windows in the apartment uh, with cardboard and whatnot. And, um, and I think from here we, we ought to get a little bit into the father and especially that first scene with him (laughs) where he goes to retrieve blood. Like that's again, spoilers. If you haven't seen let the right one in, but you know, he is essentially, um, her familiar. Yep. Although that relationship is very, very complicated. Uh, yes, and the book complicates it even more, actually. Uh, so I'm in the, yeah, go ahead. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I was just going to say, um, in the book, we actually find out more about Hawken and his past. Um, it's kind of implied in this movie, but it's not really flat out stated. But um, for those who haven't read the novel, Hawken is actually a pedophile. And he was actually caught by Ellie, you know, abusing a child. Uh, not Ellie. It's not like he tried to abuse Ellie because, you know, Ellie probably would have just wiped him out. But um, she caught him abusing a child and she was going to kill him. But she realized that because he's a pedophile and she could probably get him in, you know, immense amounts of legal issues. She basically made the offer to him to be her familiar because at the time she had lost her familiar. I believe in the book 
because in the book she's 200 years old she i mean they, she kind of implies in the film that she's been 12 years old for a long time but in the book they flat out say she's been uh, alive over 200 years which kind of makes a scene in this movie later on a little bit overly creepy but we'll, we'll get to that sure uh, yeah. you know because you're talking about a 12 year old girl with the mind of a 200 year old adult so yeah kind of interesting dichotomy there but um yeah for whatever it's worth i mean at the beginning of their relationship it's great and like i said with the hawken thing for whatever it's worth i'm almost glad they didn't include it in the movie because hawken actually almost becomes a sympathetic character in the film you know because it, it almost feels like he genuinely cares for ellie but obviously he's just kind of um stuck with her you know he can't really do much with her she'll just kill him or rat him out whatever the case may be so uh yeah it's definitely an interesting relationship with them in the book yeah and also something that is not drastically but substantially or substantively different and the remake is they re certainly recast that relationship mm -hmm. um so that uh, you know hawken isn't as quite as menacing and quite as much of a you know shitball uh <laughs> he's more pathetic than than he is uh menacing but at any rate so yeah so this dude hawken is you know on uh, going to fetch her blood and what he does is he'll uh, uh you know abduct someone to kind of knock him out uh with gas and then string them up and, um, you know, drain them of blood. And at that point, uh, you know, takes the blood home to Ellie, who then doesn't have to go out hunting. Um, and, <clears throat> but at the, like right off the bat, we never see this happen completely successfully, which is one of the things yep. I like. Uh, because he ends up kicking over uh the jug that's filled with blood and has to go chasing after it <laughs> and uh it like leaves the body strung up and whatnot and and basically comes home to ellie who gives him a little bit of what for <laughs> uh on, on account of him screwing up her meal so now she has to go out and get her own food which leads to her going to a tunnel where she sees, mm. you know, the, this dude wandering through and um, pretends to be a young girl in, knee, in like, in, in, uh, just left out in the cold. And when the guy comes to help her out, then, you know, bada bing, bada boom, she uh, drains him of blood. But that creates a further problem from, for Hawkhead, who now has to deal with the body. Mm -hmm. and so you know he has, he has to go basically shove this body in a in a pond <laughs> and try to sink it <laughs> and hope it stays sunk yeah which i mean one of the great scenes of this movie is where we realize that it has not but mm -hmm. <laughs> um but yeah it's it's like that whole sequence uh mm. and and that part of the story of understanding like oh he's he's her Renfield, but he's also kind of hapless. Yeah. It I, I, it's so I questioned. Fun. Yeah. This is the part of the film where I'm questioning how long Hawken has been with her because he almost seems like he's a new familiar because think about the choices that he made in this film. He, he ends up taking these people to like the brightest lit part of a, of a city park where anybody could come walking by you know, he, he's not looking for, like, underpasses or bridges or places where he could quietly do his thing. And later in the film, he picks a goddamn high school gymnasium of all places. I mean, his his judgment in throughout this entire film is terrible. So it, it's almost like, you know, his eventual end is an inevitability because he's just so terrible at his job. So, yeah, uh, it, it's almost frustrating to watch because you think you that Ellie would have given him some kind of training would have said here's the kind of things that you do here's what you look for when you're looking for, you know here's where you can take them and not be bothered but it's like he he is just i mean it, it's almost like watching a, a like a abbott and costello skit watching this guy try to drain a human of blood it, it, it it's it's almost laughable 
you know, if, if something just absolutely awful wasn't happening, you'd be laughing. But right. <laughs> inside, I'm still kind of laughing because it is still mildly entertaining to me that this guy who's a familiar for a 200 year old vampire is just so incredibly inept. But like I said, with the explanation in the book of who Hawken actually is, it makes a little bit more sense. Where in, whereas in the film, it's just kind of like, who is this guy and where did she find him? <laughs> yeah, where, where'd she get? The, yeah, this bargain <laughs> basement familiar. Yeah. Uh, and so another dynamic at play here is during this murder when Ellie uh, kills this guy, uh, Lack. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jock is his name. Um, Jacque. Jacque. Uh, like uh, 227. There you go. And <laughs> enjoy that <laughs> joke, old people. Um, yeah. <laughs> I almost did an impression, but I'm not going to. Yeah, it's a, probably for the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so there's this other dude, a crazy cat guy named Gosta, <laughs> who is who sees this murder sees all this go down and he goes to the local pub to let everyone know sun palace cafe is the name of the the, the place which is fun <laughs> and uh tells everyone like hey uh you know jack a just got murdered by uh something in the you know coming out from under this bridge and they're like all right go show us and so they go to the spot, but by this point, Hawken has already removed the body, but there's still some blood there. And they're like, okay, well, he's not here, but it looks like something went down, and this is unusual. <laughs> and But, you know, it's just a mystery, because they can't find the guy at this point. <laughs> and um, so then we're kind of back with Oscar and Ellie, where the next time that they meet, Ellie is uh, a, a little more friendly. She's actually solved this Rubik's Cube puzzle mm -hmm. and hands it to Oscar. And he's like, oh, how'd you do that? And she's like, well, I just took all the stickers off. Now, that's how <laughs> I did it. She, she does it for real. Um, <laughs> and uh, he asks her, uh, you know, like when's your birthday and she's like oh i don't know when my birthday is and hmm. oscar says well you can have this rubik's cube for your birthday and she's like no 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 that's fine and also do you think i smell better now and he's like yeah yeah you smell fine <laughs> <laughs> uh and also please keep the rubik's cube you know like it, it's it's sad that you don't have birthdays because all kids deserve birthdays and you know of course not knowing that she just doesn't remember what her birthday is anymore. It's just been too long. Yeah. Um, but then uh, we get into Oscar and his school life, which is uh, awful to say the least. Yeah. One of the reasons that I really, really adore this movie is I am not a fan of scenes of bullying. I already made the comment earlier that I was bullied as a child. And when I watch bullying in film, they just become frustrating. And I, especially when directors will start piling on onto a character where multiple people are bullying them. They're getting bullied at home. They're getting bullied at school. It's like, okay, I get the point. You don't have to pile on. This movie, though, like, I'm not frustrated. I'm frustrated in a different kind of way just because, you know, Oscar's outnumbered. You know, he, he can't really defend himself. And when he finally does, he gets in trouble for it. But it's, um, oh, man, it, it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, I lost my original point. Go ahead, Bo. Maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah, well, so what they do is they take uh, this stick and they're whipping him in the legs mm -hmm. with this kind of reedy branch. And then uh, for good measure, they hit him in the face. Which yeah. creates a, you know, a, a, a scratch on his face. And when he goes home that night, he tells his mother when she asks him, like, hey, what happened to your face? He's like, oh, I just fell during recess. Mm -hmm. but, okay, I yeah. remembered my original point now. Um, the scene, the bullying scenes in this movie, though they are still very frustrating, they're not hard for me to watch. They, they, 
I think the biggest part of it is that you can see emotion from both sides, especially with that the scene that we're on right now with the stick. The kid who's hitting Oscar with the stick actually breaks down in tears after a while. So you can tell that his heart's not in it. You can tell that the, the tall kids, the one who actually puts the scar on his face, you can kind of tell his heart isn't in it too. So, you know, you've got like basically one bully with a couple of toadies following him around. And um, when we get to the end of the film, there's a decision that Ellie makes about uh, who to spare that I actually really, really like, but we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, yeah. And we also, one, one thing that the movie does a, a great job with is providing a little bit of insight into the behavior of this bully where you understand at a certain point in the film that he is the way he is because that's what he knows. Mm -hmm. And that is a very nuanced way to deal with the subject of bullying. That yeah, I mean it's totally fine to hate this kid, but you also have that element of sympathy for him of like, oh well, you know, you never stood a chance. You were, you know, you grew up, you were, <laughs> you were born in it, um, <laughs> and and so yeah, after he tells his mom, you know, basically lies to her and says, hey, you're, uh, it, it was all just an accident at recess. When he sees Ellie later, though, and she says, hey, what happened to your face? Um, he tells her uh, the truth. He, he says, oh, I, you know, there are these kids at school. And that's where she gives him some, you know, pretty solid vampire advice, <laughs> which is th when they do that again, you have to fight back. You have to hit them back and you have to do it harder than you dare is how she puts it. Yeah. Um, and if you do that enough, they're going to stop. And if they don't, she says, I'll help you. Which, again, knowing where this all goes, is a horrifying <laughs> uh, promise that she <laughs> makes to him. But again, for Oscar, this is manna from heaven. He's got somebody who actually he can trust, who's his age, presumably, that he can trust and be honest with and who doesn't think that he's weak for not being able to defend himself, but is willing to say, I will help you defend yourself if it comes to that. She is his angel of light. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Which I'll, I'll quantify that later with a whole verse, but we're, we're a little ahead of ourselves. So <laughs> Yeah, so... The next day, like Oscar at this point is kind of infatuated with Ellie. You know, this is uh, a little bit of a story of first love. And, or at least for Oscar. You know, this is the first girl that he's ever, uh, you know, found mm -hmm. an attraction with and also who seems to like him. And so the next day, he uh, copies down some Morse code from an encyclopedia and they're going to use this to communicate between the walls of the apartment. And uh, then there's also him signing up for this weightlifting deal <laughs> after school. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Oscar's trying to self-actualize, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that you know, he's like, all right, well, I'm going to, if I'm going to fight back, I need to muscle up a little bit, uh, <laughs> s spend a little time at the, you know, San Andreas gym, lifting some weights. <laughs> and uh, then they, they have a bit of a date where uh -huh. he takes uh, Ellie to a candy store and... Uh, gets her to buy some candy or he buys some candy for her and she's like uh, I can't really eat that stuff um, mm. and he's like are you diabetic and she's like no I'm not diabetic that's stupid <laughs> uh, he, she's like I just don't eat sugar and uh, but finally she kind of relents and which is a really odd decision because I'm pretty sure she knew exactly what was going to happen she's been around long enough to know that she can't ingest you know normal food so I mean, obviously, you know, it's a sweet moment because she's trying to, you know, 
make Oscar feel better, not make him feel any more alienated than he already is. So she relents and takes, you know, the piece of candy or whatever it was. But I, I, I was shocked by it. I, like, I'm like, why would you do that? You, you know what's going to happen and you know he's going to see you, you know, throw it up later and you're going to have to come up with some other explanation. So why not come up with an explanation now? You know, like I, I can't eat that stuff or I'm on a very strict diet or it might upset my stomach, something along those lines. I mean, like I said, she's been around long enough to have excuses. She should have a nice file cabinet full of excuses for not for not eating human food or, you know, ingesting, you know, normal liquid, blah, blah, blah. But no, apparently she wanted to feel you know, she wanted to make Oscar feel, you know, included or special or whatever the case may be so she went ahead and did it but yeah it, it was an odd decision in, in my eyes and this begs one of the questions i have even as i watch let the right one in for the you know 20th time or whatever <laughs> and it's something i wrestle with every time i watch it which is is ellie being manipulative here or oh yeah <laughs> My friend, I think she's being manipulative in the whole movie. Okay, so there, there that is one possibility. The other possibility that I entertain is that she she truly is 12 forever. That even sure. though she has a lot more world experience, she still has the reasoning and the developmental age of at the point where she was attacked. And so even though on a rational level, she knows like, hey, I will, if I eat this, I'm going to get sick. Mm -hmm. But that 12 year old part of her takes over and it's like, well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm better. Maybe <laughs> I'm different now. And, That's a possibility. I'm, I'm open to that. And or it's a little of column A, little of column B. You know, that's mm -hmm. the other thing that I think you can you can take away from this movie is that both things can be true where she is both manipulating Oscar and genuinely has feelings for him the way that a 12 year old would for another 12 year old. Potentially. Yeah. There's just, there's so many red flags in this movie that kind of speak to the other possibility that over the years, I mean, you know, I'm very open to people looking at this as a romance over the years, my views on it have changed where I don't, I, I still look at it as a one-sided romance, but not a true romance where these two kids are falling in love with each other or anything. There's there, there's multiple things uh, coming up that kind of point to Ellie maybe being a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay, okay, we'll we'll get to this because I'm, mm -hmm. I you know, <laughs> it's like I said, it's something I wrestle with every time I watch it, which is what are her true motivations, and it's one of the. Mm -hmm great things about the movie is that it's not at no point does she twirl a mustache and say haha soon the child will be mine it, <laughs> it, it's exactly. there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in her behavior that i really like and but yeah so she eats this candy and then immediately uh just chucks this toblerone up around the corner <laughs> of the candy store and when oscar goes to find her uh he hugs her because he's, you know, he, she said that she couldn't eat it. He made her and then she's sick. And this is the first point where Ellie says to him, would you still like me if I wasn't a girl? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I guess. What? Well, that's stupid. You're clearly a girl. And she's like, oh, yeah, I am. Wink, wink. Um, and But he, he says, I guess so, is, is his response. Mm-hmm. And it, he just doesn't understand what she's asking. Like, he just has no concept yet of... Yeah. Because the question really means two things. It's it's both gender and species in a lot of ways. Uh, right. The, uh, this is an example where the book is a lot more open about it. Uh, I'll wait to kind of explain this part of the book until we, got, until we get to the reveal that's kind of coming up uh, as far as, like, Ellie's uh, gender. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the book was definitely much... And even Ellie as a character was much more open to Oscar about it. Like, she was very blunt. Uh, as opposed to where she's being a little coy in the film. But ultimately, the, the same man who wrote the novel wrote this screenplay. So, you know, it, it, 
it, w it would be weird for me to have issues with differences between the film and the novel since they were both written by the same person. So obviously these are just creative choices that were either left out of the film for one reason or another or, you know, uh, accentuated in the film for one reason or another. Yeah, and this is one of the things that they just kind of glossed over, which really adds a huge dimension to Ellie and, you know, her motivations and all of it. But we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> So, meanwhile, our old pal Hawken is starting to get a little bit of, a little bit jealous of all this, and and essentially tells Ellie, "You need to stop seeing this kid." Uh, but uh, obviously, she she is not gonna. And so, once more, Hawken is off to get some blood for Ellie, and he ends up. Uh, th this is where he gets the kid uh, alone in the weightlifting room at the school <laughs> and get knocks him out, uh, ties him up, strings him up, is, is ready to kill him and drain his blood when some of this kid's friends show back up and start banging on the window yelling for their friend who they're waiting for. And then they start banging on the window and then they come around to the door and they're banging on the door and now they're trying to force their way in. And Hawken knows that he is just good old fashioned fucked at this point. <laughs> so he has uh, a bit of a plan B, which is that he can pour acid on himself so that he can't be identified. Mm -hmm. More for Ellie's protection than his own. Yes. For sure, yeah, yeah, because in theory, this could kill him. It yeah, just exactly. doesn't, <laughs> because he's just hapless. He can't do <laughs> nothing right, including kill himself with acid. Oh, poor guy. Well, he spilled more than half the jar before he even got a chance to do it. I mean, yeah, his ineptitude is just epic. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a real something. And so uh, Ellie finds out uh, that he's been taken to the hospital. And so she goes to the hospital to ask for her father. And the, the lady behind the desk is like, uh, you know, he's up on the seventh floor. And uh, Ellie's like, gotcha, seventh floor. See you later. And so she takes off. And the, the nurse sees that Ellie doesn't have any shoes on. Mm -hmm. And is also like, you know, this is Sweden, so it's constantly dark and cold. <laughs> and, and she goes to basically offer some help to this girl and one of my favorite shots of the movie is certainly this one where you see the nurse in the foreground looking around for this poor little girl and in out of focus in the background is ellie scrambling up the wall of the hospital and it's really eerie it's the first time you really see her being completely inhuman Oh, it's it's gorgeously shot. It's it's an amazing shot. I mean, I, I yeah, I would not argue with anyone saying that's their favorite shot in the movie. It is just absolutely stunning, especially when you don't if you don't notice her right away when the nurse comes out. Like my wife didn't notice her up there. I I, I knew there. I, I saw the little black spot on the wall, and I'm like, that doesn't look right. But my wife didn't notice it. And then as soon as the nurse goes back in and Ellie continues her climb, yeah, my my wife let out an audible gasp. That was great. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's terrific. And so she makes her way up to Hawkins' window and she asks to come in. Uh hence the title of the movie. Mm -hmm. And he can't let her in because he has burned out uh his vocal cords. I actually thought he didn't let her in because of what she might do in that hospital. Like, cause you can see when, when she asks to come in, he instantly refuses. Like, obviously not verbally, but like he's shaking his hands, you know, back and forth saying, no, 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 I'll, I'll come out there. I, I huh. think he was protecting the people in the hospital from Ellie. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a theory. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> so, and, well, I've got a question about this later too, cause it came up uh, on our let me in discussion. Cause mm -hmm. it's the same beat in both stories and I don't totally understand it. So, um, cool. At any rate, we'll get there in a minute. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so instead of letting her in, he just leans out the window where she feeds on him. One last sacrifice that he makes for her. One last act of loyalty. 
Yeah, and then he just falls out of the window to his death. Oh, epic dummy death. Oh, Great. it's One terrific. of the best dummy deaths I think I've ever seen, actually. <laughs> it's really, really good. Yeah. And so now having fed, Ellie goes back to the apartment building uh, where she now lives alone. But she mm-hmm. goes to Oscar's window uh, and asks to be let in. And uh, he's like, what? What are you doing <laughs> here? Like, and I like the fact that he is just asleep and completely both uninterested in digging too deep into what's going on because he's still half asleep but uh-huh. also like what is going on why are you at my window <laughs> and she he finally says yeah 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 come on in and uh and she does he asks like how did you get here and she says i flew and he's like oh you're so silly <laughs> um but she ends up taking off her clothes and getting into bed with him and this is this is the scene yeah that is depending on how old you believe ellie is this scene could be incredibly creepy (laughs) well yeah and and so again this is the question of is this manipulation or is this her wanting comfort uh from uh from oscar is it her setting oscar up to be like okay well now that he's gone, I need somebody to do my dirty work. But if that's the case, why pick a 12-year-old, you know? Well, my, my thoughts were that if you pick a 12-year-old, he's going to be your familiar for a very long time. You know, he's he's obviously not at his peak strength or physical ability yet, but he'll get there. And in the, in the time that he gets there, you know, Ellie will be able to show him some things, show him the ropes, things like that. I mean, if she were to decide not to turn Oscar, he could be a familiar for her for a good 50, 60 years, which, you know, probably still a good chunk of change for a vampire, even though they're eternal. Well, yeah, that's another, you know, 25% of her life or whatever. But And yeah. she also points <laughs> out, like, later in the in the film, but they talk about his capacity for violence mm-hmm. and, and how she recognizes, like, oh, you were going to kill... Like, you weren't just stabbing that tree for exercise. You were doing it because you thought about killing someone. And so I, she sees that. I, it's, again, it, it's it's complicated. And it's, I mean, this is why I feel like, uh, this is one of the many reasons why I feel that this is a manipulation. Because she talks about how she recognized the violence in him. Because what 12-year-old girl is going to fall in love with a boy stabbing a tree? Yeah. Like, he, he obviously has violent tendencies. Do you really want to be around a kid who even owns a knife, you know, let alone knows how to use it? So just another thing pointing to me of her just setting up her future familiar. The argument I would make against it, and I don't disagree. I'm mm-hmm. just, I, I, it, it's just fun to explore these things. Sure. Um, but the other side of that could be that she recognizes a kindred spirit of someone who outwardly is a child but is possessed of of a really adult kind of darkness yeah valid and and so um yeah i but i i kind of like living in that twilight where her motivations aren't entirely clear and in the movie they're (laughs) not you know they're exactly like i said there's no there's no point in the movie where, you know, as soon as Oscar leaves, she turns to the camera and is like, ah, <laughs> now my pants I mean. are in motion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, depending on how you take Ellie's motivation, it, it makes the ending of the film either tragic or joyful. It, it, it really changes the context of that ending. But like I said, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm kind of of the mind that it's sort of both of those things at once. It can be absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, when I, when I you know as I'm watching a vampire movie, she is a monster to me. She, 100%. I'm not saying I'm not saying that there's no humanity left in there because she was turned as a 12 year old. So there's probably going to be a childlike innocence there, you know, regardless of how old she becomes. But I, I just. I, I do agree with you that it could be both things, um, and I, I honestly I would like it to be both things. I would love to have a definitive feeling that 
Ellie loved Oscar, that she actually had genuine feelings for him and that it's not just setting up her future familiar. That yes, that's a big part of it, but that she also is looking forward to the years that they're going to share together. So yes, I would love to believe that, but it's just the more and more and more that I watch this film over the years, the more I'm convinced that, that Ellie's um, motivations are nefarious. All right, well let's let's keep trudging here because <laughs> we're getting into some good shit. Um, all right, so while they're in bed together, uh, he he mentions like, "Oh my god, you're naked," and she's like, <laughs> "Yeah, is that okay?" He's like, "Yeah, totally." Um, so, do you want to go steady? And she's like, "Ugh, <laughs> all right." Um, <laughs> what an odd question for a twelve-year-old. Like, yeah. wait. We've never, I mean, we've been on one kind of sort of date where you threw up. Do you want to go steady? <laughs> but yeah, but also that's, that's being a child, you know, of Absolutely. Like, yeah, you know, right. Hey, we, we had one kiss one time. So that, that makes you my girlfriend. And, uh, but for Ellie, she's like, I, I don't want to make this complicated. And, it, mm-hmm. and then she's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Does it? does anything really change and he's like well no not really she's like okay we're going steady then and also you need to understand i'm not a girl and he's like yeah (laughs) you're silly ellie (laughs) exactly yeah this is this is where ellie is coy as opposed to in the book where she just flat out says exactly what she is we get a long explanation about her past um how I, mean, I don't know how in depth I want to go into it because honestly, it's some really, really cool stuff that I would I would want everyone to re- try to read this novel if you can. If you are a mind to read horror novels, this is a great one. And if you are a fan of this movie and you're a reader, there's no reason not to read this novel. It, it just adds so much more to the movie as opposed to some books and movies where you're kind of like, ah, oh, the movie ruined the book or vice versa, whatever the case may be. No, these two, because they were both written by the same person, they both work well together. Even when, you know, something might be a little bit different or left out, as I said earlier, it, it all just flows beautifully. So whether you're reading the book or the, or watching the film, it's a beautiful story that, takes us on a wonderful journey it's just the journey is a little bit longer and more detailed in the book so l- let me tell you what i believe i know of the book and mm-hmm. we'll do this in a broad stroke kind of way all right so my understanding of her character in the book is that it is very clear she was male at the time she was attacked and it, yes and her- it, and it mm-hmm. was the viciousness of the attack that led to the castration. Oh, uh, no. Okay, okay. Um, uh, let's, let's, let's have a little history lesson, shall we? Please. Uh, back in the 16 and 1700s, uh, sopranos were very sought after, um, especially children. Children who could sing at the soprano register were very sought after in concert halls and by royalty and, and things like that. There was a practice called, cast. Uh, well, obviously, uh, the, the practice of castration to make these young boys continue to be sopranos after they hit puberty. Obviously, once they're castrated, they can't hit puberty. And that's the point. And they are called castrati. If anyone's ever heard the term castrati, that's what that is. It, it is a person who has had their genitals removed so that they could still sing as a soprano. Um, the man, uh, the vampire who actually turned Ellie was one of those English aristocrats. We never find out his name. We only know him as the man in the wig. The man in the wig had a actual business where he would find these young boys who were wonderful sopranos and he would forcefully castrate them and then sell them to other aristocrats and, you know, owners of concert halls and things like that. And they were basically slaves. They basically had to sing for a living. They were never allowed to leave the theater or the mansion, wherever it is they were held. Ellie was born Elias. Her real name is Elias. And she was one of these sopranos. She had a beautiful, beautiful singing voice. When she was 12, uh, her owner, her, her uh, maybe not owner, but her guardian, I guess would be the best term, decided to, uh, you know, castrate her to keep her a soprano. 
after castrating her, she raged against her master, the man in the wig, um, and eventually attacking him, not knowing that he was actually a vampire. So it was the same man that castrated Elias that also turned him into a vampire. So yeah, and then uh, Elias decided to change his name to Ellie and live life as a girl because he would forever have a girl's voice. So there ah. you go. And Ellie is a castrati. All right. Okay. I, uh, I, that is fascinating. I really like that. <laughs> so, okay. So Ellie then uh, ends up leaving before Oscar wakes up. Uh, and when he wakes up the next morning, there is, uh, it, it's actually a line from Romeo and Juliet to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have to, to flee to live, or, uh, to stay is to die. To linger is to death. flee is to flee is life. To linger is death. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just another seed of manipulation in my eyes. <laughs> She's planting the seed of uh, of uh, Oscar becoming more of a nomad than a homebody, and especially with him having kind of the troubles that he has with his parents. Both of his parents, his parents are they're separated. I'm not sure if they're divorced, but at the very least, they're separated. They live apart. And I think that separation and that lack of a true home, because Oscar, it seems like Oscar shares his time equally at his father's house and his mother's house. The majority of the film, he's living with his mother. Uh, we do get to see one scene with Oscar and his dad, and, the, you know, it, which, which turns into kind of like a, you know, a couple of homosexual guys getting you know, blackout drunk, which kind of shows the home life that Oscar is kind of dealing with. His mother does seem like she's a little bit more attentive, but she also flies off the handle really easily. So like I said, I, I, once Ellie sees this, I think she understands that he is a good candidate to run away, to leave home altogether. And I feel like this poem is just another seed in that uh, eventual end. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, again, I think that is, you know, Depending on motivation, I think the action itself, you know, kind of speaks louder than words there that she is definitely <laughs> grooming him um, to like whether her, the motivation is romantic or at least there's an element of romance. She definitely sees an Oscar. Oh, I need I need someone to replace Hawken. <laughs> and why on earth w wouldn't I pick this kid who clearly is enamored with me and also yeah. can can get into some shit like he is you know he's he's got uh problems yeah i mean hey if, if he keeps working out the way he is he's gonna be a great familiar yeah yeah he's on on pace to be like top five yeah uh, familiar <laughs> uh but yeah so then we have a confrontation between oscar and his bullies which has been sort of building up and this is where Oscar, you know, takes this stick uh, when they're on, you know, this field trip out at the pond or whatever. And and it, you 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 uh, did you skip over the irony of what that stick is? I, or, or did you not notice? I maybe didn't notice. What was? Is it the same That's, stick that Hawken used? Exactly. It's okay. the same red stick that Hawken uh, jammed, uh, what was it, Joke's uh, body into the river. Yeah, he. I guess he got scared and dropped it, and Oscar found it the next day. <laughs> ah, stupid Hawken, always dropping his murder yep. weapons. Uh, that's really good, though. I don't know if I'd noticed that before, but that makes a whole <laughs> yeah. lot of sense. Um, yeah, so uh, he takes this stick, and when... Um, you know, they, they start to harass Oscar. He ends up with well, Connie is the, you know, this bully's name, mm -hmm. just whacks him in the head with this stick. And it's a great moment with well, the, the, the rea delayed reaction of this kid of yeah. like getting hit in the head. And then like registering like, Holy shit, this kid just whacked me in the skull really good. Mm -hmm. And while this is going down on one side of the pond, on the other side of the pond, a couple of the young girls who have been sent to pee behind some trees uh, <laughs> have been terrified because they find a body frozen in the ice, which, of course, is uh, Jackie. Mm -hmm. And so then we get another one of my favorite shots of the movie, 
where the police are cu- like cut this body free and just use uh, essentially a tow truck to lift it in a big circle of ice out of the water <laughs> with this guy frozen in it. And, oh, it's real good. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> so, meanwhile... Let the, us not, though, uh, before we move on, yeah. let us not gloss over how satisfying and cathartic that head smack was. When he hits connie in the head with that stick i i I shouldn't wish violence on anyone i i know this but again i've already talked about my past multiple times you have no idea how satisfying that smack was to me i let out an audible laugh the first time i saw it it was just and, and i know it's wrong you know ultimately you shouldn't be cheering for violence necessarily but man when a bully gets his in a film or hers um it is just one of the most guilty pleasure cathartic moments that i could ever enjoy and this movie is it's absolutely glorious especially the way the shot is framed where it's kind of a not not quite a far shot but kind of a medium shot where you're seeing you still see both full figures and he just takes a full-on like a baseball bat swing at this kid's head oh my god i i should not have had an ear-to-ear grin on my face during this scene but i absolutely did and i always do (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it's always fun to see a bully get theirs, and he oh, yeah. takes a crack to the noggin that, it, like <laughs> you said, it's super satisfying. Um, <laughs> and and almost more so is seeing him later with the bandage over his head. Oh, where yeah, you're like, yeah. oh, yeah, this required him to go to the hospital. And that Oscar, Oscar should take a baseball. <laughs> yeah, right? Knock the leather <laughs> off of it. Yeah. And uh, so after school. Um, Oscar's mother is, you know, informed of what's going down and, um, Oscar is in some degree of trouble for all of this, but, uh, he ends up, you know, kind of stealing away later with Ellie to a basement room of the school. And, um, in Ellie asks like, well, this is cool and all, but why are we here? And he's like, ah, we're going to mix blood. (laughs) What a time to want to be blood brothers. (laughs) Right, right. Hey, you know, you gave me the courage. I did it, Ellie. I knocked this kid in the skull and really split his ear right open. It felt really good. And while I'm sure she was like, you know, I'm down with that. But you cutting your palm like this, Mm. uh, that is going to have an unexpected reaction. And his blood drips on the floor as he's saying like, no, 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 let's mix blood. Come on, Ellie. And this hunger for blood overtakes her. And so she drops to her knees and starts to lap up the blood. And then freaks out because she realized like, oh, I'm revealing myself to Oscar. Mm -hmm. And so she takes off. And so not b- before, uh, not before kind of changing her look too. did you see how she looked older for that one shot? Yeah. And then after she had a little bit of, of the blood, she went back to her normal Ellie look. I absolutely love that shot. And she does it multiple times in the movie. It's just, you're not really looking for it, but there, there's at least two, maybe three times in the movie where she shows herself as slightly older. I don't, yeah. I don't know what that's representing if if she's um not actually 12 and she's just pretending or you know i ultimately i can't wrap my head around it but for whatever it's worth from a cinematic standpoint i love it i love those shots it, it's sort of i think when she is at her most monstrous yes, yes. and when she's drinking blood yep yeah and uh let's meanwhile catch up with the good people of the sun palace cafe <laughs> And uh, Locke, uh, who is Jacques' uh, drinking buddy, um, hears that, oh, you know, they found this body in, in the ice. So he and his girlfriend, Virginia, go to Crazy Cat Guy Gasta's place to try to convince him to tell the police what he saw. Because, he, you know, he witnessed this murder. And then it just becomes this weird conversation about like Virginia being like, why are you so obsessed with this? 
And he's like, well, because you're cold. And at least with Jake, I could get along. And, you know, we were buddies. And you're just, you know, this frigid ice queen. Yeah. Wow. And so she gets pissed at him and storms out. And uh, so Lack is following her, chasing after her because, you know, she's walking out on him. And there's a terrific shot of her storming ahead of him. And then out of the trees (laughs) comes Ellie (laughs) just descending on her. And he like Ellie gets in uh, some bites, some uh, some blood suction, but Lack is able to kick her off before Virginia dies. And so, you know, Ellie scrambles off. Lack takes Virginia home. And the next day, immediately, she realizes that, oh, the sun is fucking with me. And so she has to, you know, she begins to suspect at this point something is not quite right. And so she goes to back to Gosta's apartment looking for Lack and instead is attacked by all of Gosta's CGI cats. Yeah, the angriest CGI cats and sleepwalkers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody killed with a corn cob in this movie. No, no. <laughs> Unlike Sleepwalkers. If you've never seen Sleepwalkers, you should see it just for a guy getting killed with uh, some corn on the cob. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and maybe only that. Although Alice Krieg is, uh, as always, oh, great. She's, yeah, she's great. Uh, but anyway, uh, after getting viciously attacked by all these cats, Virginia gets away and then goes to the hospital. Or is taken to the hospital. And... She understands, like, oh, when that girl bit me, something happened. Yeah. And she basically tells Lack, like, I don't want to live. Like, something's wrong with me. That girl put something inside me that is is Mm -hmm. rotten. Thank you so much for seeing that. You can't believe how many people I've gotten into disagreements with who say that Virginia didn't know what was going on when she asked the guy to open the window. And I'm like, no, I kind of think she absolutely knew what was going to happen. But yeah, you, you can't change some people's minds. But thank you for seeing that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, that seems clear to me that she's like, oh, this girl did something to me and I know it's mm-hmm. bad and I don't need to live like this. Yep. And But yeah, she tells this doctor in the middle of the day or, you know, early morning, she's like, hey, doc, how about you open up them blinds? And then comes my favorite shot of the film. Oh, it's <laughs> and you're yes. This is probably the most beautiful and horrible shot all at the same time. Because yeah, uh, yeah. The the blinds open up, sunlight pours in, and Virginia just goes up in a column of flame just bursts in the flame and the way that they have the camera at the far end of the room so that you've got both you've got virginia in the in the middle of the frame burning in the bed and then you've got you know um her boyfriend and the doctor framing either side of her both of them like what the hell do we do it is a masterful shot absolutely love it yeah it's beautiful Mm. and so back to our good friends Oscar and Ellie (laughs) Oscar now has uh, figured out that Ellie is a vampire and goes to her apartment sees like oh you you guys have no furniture in here Uh, notes that Ellie smells bad again (laughs) and also uh, you know comes right out and says are you a vampire Mm-hmm. the one and only time the word is spoken in the movie yep and and she tells him uh she doesn't answer the question directly she says i need blood to live yeah she doesn't answer any questions directly in this film <laughs> yeah that's true that's yeah. true i'm not a girl i'm something else <laughs> don't worry about it <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah we'll burn that bridge when we come to it there you go <laughs> uh So he leaves and kind of gives her like, are you going to try to stop me? Are you going to vampire out on me? And she's like, no, you you can leave. 
And then she goes back to his place and after he leaves and uh, she says, you have to invite me in. And he says, well, what if I don't? And then he gives her this little, you know, ticky, ticky, tick. Oh, what an asshole. It, it's, that, a, <laughs> it's a jerk move. It really is. I mean, that is a jerk ass move. I, if, if you believe, if even an iota of you believes that this girl is a vampire and she's telling you that she can't come in without permission to actually invite her in just to quote, see, you know, quote unquote, see what happens that that's a really shitty move to me i mean again he's 12 you know this is all new to him i understand that but man just the, even the look on his face like he almost knew something bad was gonna happen he's got like a wry smile on his face it's it's a really odd um just part of a scene in general it's, yeah mm. you don't know whether or not he's just being playful or a sadist yeah exactly <laughs> And maybe a little bit of both, as, as uh, I often land on this movie. But yeah, so uh, he doesn't invite her in. And this is where I come to my question in both of these movies. Uh, in both this and Let Me In, same thing happens. Mm -hmm. Where at one point earlier in the movie, she asks to be let into his bedroom. And he says, that's cool. And she comes in. So why now does she have to ask at this point? Or is it every time? I'm not sure, to be 100% honest. I, I, What's funny is I actually did do some research on this as far as vampire mythology and the whole invitation thing. And there's like a lot of different rules and, and even loopholes. Like, like, for example, if you have a welcome mat outside your front door, that counts as an invitation to a vampire. You don't have to physically say you can come in. A welcome mat is enough. Uh, an open door, literally a door that's unlocked could potentially be looked at by a vampire as an invitation. Um, it depends on the mythology that you're reading. It depends on, you know, what vampire world you're in. But uh, but as far as your question, I honestly don't know because I thought of that myself too on a couple of occasions. Like, isn't his bedroom part of the apartment? Or do you actually physically need an invitation to every room in the house? So, I, yeah. I, unfortunately, in my research, I was not able to find a, a convincing enough answer for that question. Yeah, and I don't like. I don't want to be a dick about it and be like, oh, plot hole. It's more just like, <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't understand because I, I trust that this was considered, oh, and, yeah. and there's probably a good. Like, Lingfus could probably give me a, a very satisfying answer. And I wonder if it's not like, oh, well, the bedroom is kind of Oscar's, but the rest of the house is, is not really his. Mm, that's not bad. So, I yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure. But mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. Anyway, she does come in without the invitation. And this is the scene that you see uh, on all of the box art and that kind of thing, where Ellie starts bleeding from you know her shoulders and her back and her ears and her eyes and her forehead uh it's really a great effect oh it's beautiful it really is and when oscar sees this though he very quickly is like oh no 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 you can come in you can come in i didn't i didn't mean that <laughs> and um they end up uh hugging again and mm -hmm. Oscar says, like, hey, why don't you take a shower and you can take one of my mother's old dresses. And mm -hmm. uh, and this is the moment that, you know, it launched a thousand conversations <laughs> where as she's dressing, uh, Oscar peeks in and sees in a, a very quick glimpse in the film mm -hmm. um, the scars across her genitals. Mm -hmm. And then before uh they can go kind of go any further oscar's mother comes home and uh ellie you know goes out his window uh across the building and back into uh her apartment and they kind of lean out the window and kind of giggle together <laughs> yeah. like you know they're sharing this secret they got away with something <laughs> yeah yeah very much so and um and the next morning, he finds a note from her uh, asking, hey, you know, do you want to meet this evening? And, of course, he does. Um, but Lack has traced Ellie to her apartment. Like, he, you know, been asking around about 
uh, this this man and and this strange girl that moved into this apartment building, and he gets into uh, her apartment and finds her in the bathtub. Mm-hmm. But obviously, all the windows have been covered over, so he can't really see. So he starts to tear down the cardboard covering the window. And what he doesn't realize is that Oscar was in the apartment as well, waiting for Ellie to wake up. And when he sees what's going on, he screams out no as, you know, Lack uh, uncovers Ellie. And uh, when that happens, when he screams, Ellie wakes up and jumps on Lack and ends up killing him. And she sa- she thinks Oscar, but she's like, "This means I gotta go. Like I can't it, now that this now that they found me, I have to leave immediately." And so that very night, Oscar sees out his window, Ellie getting in a cab. <laughs> um, but uh, the next day, Oscar gets a call from this kid, Martin saying hey are you gonna be at swimming practice this afternoon and he's like well maybe why and martin's like look i i no 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 it's not what you think i'm just glad that you finally put connie in his place and you know we're all just very happy that you stood up to to connie looking forward to seeing you later today at the pool and so Oscar, feeling pretty good about himself, does in fact go to the uh, swim practice. And this is all, of course, an elaborate setup where the bullies and the older brother of Connie um, set fire to a dumpster behind the school. Mm-hmm. And the teacher goes out to investigate. And then Connie and the older brother and the other, uh, the other kids, Andreas, um, Martin, they all pile into the pool area. And this older brother, Jimmy, orders everybody out of the pool, except for Oscar. And there's a moment where I think it's Martin who is like kind of doing an impression of the teacher. Yeah. And making it seem like he's helping Oscar out with his, uh, you know, swimming motions. Yeah. Yeah. And Oscar kind of laughs about it. And it's one of the moments in this movie where he looks the most like defenseless and frail Mm -hmm. and also just entirely childlike. Yeah. And I mean, he, he thinks he made a friend, like an actual (laughs) real friend. So yeah, I, I would smile too. Um, but it's just heartbreak. It, it, especially oh, yeah. knowing what's coming, you're like, oh, Oscar, you need to get out of that pool and you need to run, kid. <laughs> but uh, instead, what happens is everybody flees the pool except for the bullies and Oscar. Jimmy um, has, uh, I think it's Oscar's knife, right? It's it's his knife? Uh, no, no, because Oscar's knife is a one piece and Jimmy's knife was a switchblade. Okay. But he yeah. says, like, I'm going to give you a chance either uh, I'm going to, I'm going to push your head underwater. If you can hold your breath for three minutes, I'll only uh, scratch your cheek. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, I'm going to take out one of your eyes. Jesus. And, oh man. And the way he puts it, he says it's an eye for an ear. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. This is, this is a weird part of the film for me because, you know, obviously we've all seen the news where bullies kind of take it a little too far. Um, I'm, I'm questioning, like, was Connie's big brother actually gonna murder Oscar? Like, it, was that the intention? Was the intention to scare him? Or was the intention to actually murder this kid? Because, uh, first of all, a big brother finishing his little brother's fights, I mean, that's a bitch move right there to begin with. But at the same time, Um, because of, you know, earlier we spoke about Connie's upbringing and where he comes from. This is his brother who, his big brother who probably bullied him his entire childhood as well, which is what made Connie what he is now. But 
my whole thing that I've never really understood about bullies is the satisfaction in belittling someone so much smaller and younger than you. Like, well, how is that satisfying in any way, shape, or form? Like, I've, I've just never understood the bully mentality, and I don't want to, in all honesty. But, um, like I said, I, I've always just questioned his um, motivation in this scene. Like I said, is his intention to actually murder Oscar? Because if it is, then you're being just as sloppy as Hawken was for the majority of the movie. I mean, you've got, if you started a fire at a school, there's going to be a fire truck there in minutes. So it's like, you're very obviously going to be, if it wasn't for Ellie, you're probably going to get caught anyway. So what is the end game? That was like always my kind of question with this scene. What is his end game? And I, I'm still on the fence. I don't know, you know, obviously with a bully, you, you always think, oh, they're just trying to scare people. But then you've got people, you know, like uh, what's his face from it carving his initials into a fat kid's belly. Uh, that that goes a little bit beyond just wanting to scare someone. So yeah, I, I just don't understand necessarily his motivation. Like, was was he really going to hold his head under there for three minutes? Obviously, we'll never know. It's all it's all up to interpretation at this point. But like I said, just this scene just. When I say this scene leaves a bad taste in my mouth, I, I'm not exaggerating. Like, I can taste the bile coming up from my stomach as soon as I see this kid enter the pool area. And it's just one of those things where if they would have had a little scene outside the school where he went, where, where he was talking to his little brother saying, okay, we're going to scare him, okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have hated him as much and obviously not cared about his eventual end, but... Yeah, this scene has always kind of left me scratching my head a little bit. Um, just like I said, just with Connie's brother's motivation. Yeah, and I think you can kind of infer, I, th I think I'm using that right, that <laughs> Connie is, you know, bullied by Jimmy, mm -hmm. who is probably bullied by their father. Mm -hmm. Or or the father, you know, uh, abuses both kids to some degree. But whether or not he was going to go all the way to murder here, I have my doubts about that. But again, it's open to interpretation. But I think this is just, I'm going to prove to my younger brother that I am more of a man than he is or something. <laughs> By beating uh, up a 12-year-old. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying the, the logic is sound, but it's oh, also yeah, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> It's it's partly I'm defending my brother, but also I'm kind of showing my brother up to show like this little pipsqueak kid that stood up to my brother. I'm gonna make sure he never does it again. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if he was gonna go so far as to to drown the kid, but also if he did and then just walked away, then maybe in his you know damaged psychology, he was thinking, well, I can get away with that. We can just say that hey, that you know this little scrawny kid drowned in the pool couldn't get out or something who mm -hmm. knows but of course what happens is he shoves oscar's head underwater after telling him to take a deep breath and then in comes ellie uh which the beauty of this moment is yeah. that we don't see much of we we, we see from oscar's kind of point of view under the water what the effects of Ellie's mayhem above the, the water is. Um, exactly. You know, you see a I, severed arm and a severed head. and <laughs> I, I was the first time, maybe the first couple of times I watched this film, I was a little upset that we did not get to see Ellie's attack. I always, it, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I have that guilty pleasure thing where I want to watch bullies get their comeuppance as well. And I remember the first couple of times thinking, man, I would have loved to have seen what she did. But you know what? As the years go by and I watch the film more and more and more, I'm actually glad that they shot it the way they did. Because it's almost dreamlike to watch that, you know, because it's almost silent because it's underwater. You know, you're only you're watching Oscar's head being held down and, you know, everything else that's going on. By the way, if you if you own the Blu-ray, there's a great behind the scenes on this scene specifically where they kind of show all the contraptions that they put together to have the kids feet kind of skim across the pool and then get pulled up right away. It's actually really cool. It also includes an interview with the director, Thomas Alfredson. Um, but yeah, uh, like I said, over the years, I totally understand now why 
they did not show that attack. It's just, it, it makes the scene so beautiful, almost heart wrenching, honestly. Yeah. And it keeps the focus on Oscar. Yep. You know, as opposed to uh, showing, and you're right. I, there, there is part of me that would absolutely love to see this massacre, <laughs> but I respect so much more the artfulness of seeing only bits and pieces of it and letting yeah. your imagination fill in the blanks of all yeah, of that. Because ultimately, if they show us the scene, what are we watching? A 12-year-old kill about a half dozen other 12-year-olds. I mean, is that really satisfying? Uh, you know, it's questionable. I, I, I think I would have found some satisfaction out of it. But like I said, I understand why they didn't then. And then Ellie pulls Oscar out of the pool. And uh, we see that there is one one poor kid left sobbing on uh on the side of the pool of the bleachers oh and i love that too because yeah. that's the kid who beat the shit out of oscar's leg earlier in the film with the stick he's not the tall one who actually left the mark on his face but during the pool scene during the attack you actually see him kind of crawl not crawl but like back away like slowly back away from the situation and then he just sits on the bleachers and kind of puts his head in his palm and then when we actually, after the attack is over and we see him still alive on the bleachers, I absolutely love that. Ellie's not concerned with witnesses. She's concerned with punishing the guilty. Yeah. And uh, just like I said, uh, just absolutely as satisfying a scene as a scene can be. <laughs> it, yes, it's very, very good. And uh, that brings us to the epilogue of the film in which now that Oscar has been saved by Ellie, he is fully on team ellie as we see by uh them on a train together him in a seat her in this you know big basket and uh you don't initially know what it is until you hear the morse code tapping from within and oscar you know does the tap and slide finger back where uh they um he essentially uh, taps out the word kiss to mm -hmm. her <laughs> morse code yeah and that is the the end of let the right one in yeah and and this is what i've been talking about the the whole time is that this ending is equal parts heartwarming or tragic depending on how you look at ellie's motivation as i've said it's kind of flip-flopped over the years of me watching it but I also do like the fact that it could be both. That Ellie could have a legitimate emotional attachment with this kid, even though she has a greater purpose for him. Um, she could still potentially feel something. But like I said, the more I watch the film, the more I feel uh, that it's the latter, that she's just using him to get a new familiar. Um, there are little things like when they have their only kiss in the film, Ellie does not close her eyes and she, you could see her staring at Oscar while they're kissing. It's almost like her checking. Oh, okay. Is this working? Is he buying into it? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> like I, like I said, the, uh, the poem from, uh, Romeo and Julia from earlier, just uh, again, planting that seed in Oscar's head that he needs to roam and be free to actually live a life as opposed to just staying, you know, where he is in his sedentary life and not doing anything, you know? Um, so, you know, like I said, there, there's a bunch of little things like that, um, that kind of helped me out. There's also another weird thing about this film too. Um, on one of the evenings when, um, Oscar goes out to meet, uh, Ellie, the time is 11, 14 PM. Now, I don't know if there's any correlation to this at all, but what I found was in the Bible, in Corinthians 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 14, reads as this, For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. It's huh. almost like they're throwing a little sign in there. Because uh, you remember earlier, I called Ellie um, Oscar's angel of light. Because yeah. ultimately, she she knows that he has a rough life. He has no friends. He's being bullied. And she is helping him out, both emotionally and physically. Helping him find his confidence to be able to defend himself. Because he's obviously going to need that later on as her familiar. Um, 
the the thing that kind of worries me about Oscar being her familiar though is in the scene when Locke shows up in uh, the apartment. Do you remember Oscar is behind Locke and just as Locke pulls out his little pocket knife, Oscar uh, pulls out his knife, the knife yeah. that he's been carrying the whole movie. But then when he sees Ellie attack him, he drops the knife and never picks it up. We never see the knife again the rest of the movie. So it's almost like Oscar does have a dark side, but it's questionable whether he's going to be able to go that extra step to actually murder someone. So it's still kind of questionable. So, um, you know, like I said, Ellie, Ellie, what's that? Yeah. Oh, give him time. Absolutely. He's only 12 for God's sake. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Ellie helping Oscar throughout this movie correlates with that Corinthians 1114 so much. And like I said, the fact that the clock reads 1114 PM, I don't know if it's the first night they meet or if it's just one of the subsequent nights, but yeah. 11 14 p.m and there is this uh quote um so yeah uh i mean what, what other little things do i have i already mentioned that ellie is actually 200 years old it's mentioned in the book it's not mentioned in the movie um we already talked about her being a soprano or he being a soprano and being castrated oh did you notice how brightly lit the night scenes in this film are yeah for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that was a purposeful choice by Tomas Alfredson because he wanted to he wanted the audience to have the impression that um, Ellie and Oscar because they both have their issues with daytime Oscar with bullies Ellie obviously she's a vampire that they can't hide from their troubles despite it being nighttime it's still so brightly lit that it's supposed to imply they can't get away from the darkness that's chasing both of them. Huh. And I, I didn't really, I, I hadn't really thought about that until I, I, I watched the interview on the Blu-ray with Tomas. And he mentions that he mentions a couple of really cool things about the movie too. Uh, did you notice that most of the adults in the movie don't actually look at the children, not counting the parents, of course, Oscar's mother and father, um, anybody who has a direct a relationship with the child will. But but like when the kids came to tell the coach about the fire, he never turned around. He kept moving forward and doing the motion that he was doing with Oscar. And he wasn't looking down at Oscar either. He was looking across the pool. Uh, the scene when Hawken gets yelled at by Ellie, he never looks at her. He never turns around to look at her. And um, the director said that it's basically because the adults in this town look at children as background players. They don't look at them as, you know, featured players in this thing called life that they're all being a part of. All the adults start to look at Ellie, people like Locke, people like Virginia. They actually start to look at Ellie uh, almost to symbolize that as adults, they now see her as a threat. She's no longer just a, a child. She is now a monster. And now they're paying attention to her. Now they're actually looking at her. So I, I thought that was really something I hadn't really noticed, but huh. I thought was really cool. But yeah, next time you watch it, check it out. The adults do everything they can to not look at these kids while they're talking to them. There's, There's obviously going to be examples of the opposite, but I'm saying a lot of it. A lot of the adults do not recognize the children here as actual people. There is a weird inverse of that in Let Me In. Oh, <laughs> where the where Oscar's parents are never directly seen. They're either out of focus or at a distance or on the oh. phone or something like that. So that there is never a moment where you see Oscar and a, a parent both clearly seen in the same shot. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So um, I like that. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, almost a because you could look at it the same way where the the adult or excuse me where the children, um, you know, since they spend most of their day with other kids, adults are like background players to oh, them. Exactly, exactly, That's and, cool. and and especially with the character of uh, Owen is the, the the child in the movie as opposed to Oscar, but yeah. in Let Me In, Owen um, is just so clearly isolated that you know his. his he doesn't feel as if his parents see him and thus he doesn't really look at his parents as being significant characters in his life. And, yeah. and anyway, very, I, I, like I said, not trying to twist your arm to see it, but it is done with a measure of care. Even if some of the decisions made 
in Let Me In, I don't 100% agree with. Um, mm-hmm. it, it obviously was done with a lot of, of care and thought. Um, but I, I mean, with your with your recommendation, I, I may, you know, go ahead and check it out. Like I said, I still it's one of those things of I already have the perfect movie here. Why would I sure. watch something trying to reproduce the perfect movie? <laughs> yes. And it, it right. And and the pro- the biggest problem with Let Me In is that Let the Right One In exists. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Let Me In would be great if it existed in and of itself. Right. But, if if yeah. it had only been the original novel and then this adaptation, the Let Me In adaptation, mm-hmm. you'd be like, holy shit, that movie's great. Uh, but the <laughs> fact that Let the Right One In exists, it's like, yeah, it's not like as far as remakes go, it was it was done with an eye towards can we make this as good a movie as possible? But also, there is something lightning in a bottle esque about "Let the Right One In" for me. In fact, let, all right, so let's just jump to some of these performances here. Yes. Um, obviously, the big stunner in the movie is Lena Lee Anderson as Ellie, mm-hmm. who is just like conveys she has these big soulful eyes. Yeah. And is able to communicate so much. It's one of the reasons that watching this in the in the native language is so easy because so much of the movie you get from yeah. her expression and her looks. That's actually a that, that's another thing that the director was actually talking about during this um, the uh, behind the scenes interview. They originally they wanted this to be a silent film. There wasn't going to be any dialogue in it whatsoever. Um, and then. Uh, the director and the screenwriter got together and they're like, well, it's probably not going to play as well in outside markets if we do it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's still a minimal amount of dialogue in the movie. I mean, considering, you know, how, how much dialogue can be in your average two hour film. Um, this one, it, it is pretty minimized. I mean, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of the uh, emotion is expressed through facial expressions and just, you know, tone of voice and things like that, as opposed to just spelling out, you know, exactly how someone feels or whatever. So the fact that this started out as a silent film probably lead lends to your point right now. Uh, yeah, she's so good. And uh, of course, you've got uh, Care Hedebrandt mm-hmm. as Oscar. Uh, who is also very, very good. Like, he he very convincingly moves on the pendulum between being almost pathetically small <laughs> and also a sense that, oh, this kid can be kind of dangerous. The quiet ones always are, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, see, that's why I'm so gregarious and non-threatening <laughs> is that I don't shut up. There you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think both of them, I mean, it's their movie, and and if either oh, of yeah. them were not phenomenal, the movie would fall apart. Yeah, I'm actually shocked that Lena didn't do more. I mean, she's only done three films, and I, I'm not sure if she's like officially retired from acting, but yeah, she's never really done much. It, like and one other movie after this, maybe? Yeah, she uh, a few years later she did a couple, but it's been eight years since, since she's appeared in a film, and yeah. maybe so, maybe it was just you know, hey, like how do you improve on this? So I'm just gonna take my let the right one in money, and <laughs> and live, live on a, residuals. <laughs> yeah, just live a quiet life here in in Sweden. Um, but yeah, it's a she's yeah she's so good. Yeah. Um, and and the other shout out I would give is uh, Per Ragnar as Hawkins, yes. who is is again you know it's a, a fun dichotomy of being very threatening but also completely pathetic in his actions and yeah, it's wonderful. He, he he's the one that really leaves me scratching my head throughout the film. Like I said, if we would have gotten some kind of throwaway line maybe on how long Ellie and Hawken have been together. It may have, may have made a little bit more sense how she allows him, you know, to have, to be this inept. Ultimately, if he brings home the blood, she doesn't care how he does it. But the fact that on multiple occasions, he comes home empty handed um, and forcing her to go out and hunt herself. It's like, I, I'm actually surprised she didn't make a more drastic decision earlier in the film. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, anybody else you want to you want to call out? 
uh, for, for performances? I mean, honestly, I, I love everyone's performance in here. If I'm going to call anybody else out, I would probably say Virginia, like, uh, played by Ica Nord. Yeah. Um, even though she's not in the film for very long, she is another one who's able to emote with her facial expressions. Because, like I said, when, when we see that moment in the hospital when she asks the doctor to open the blinds, there's a sense of almost peace in her face. Like she knows what's coming and she knows that it's all going to end here in a little bit. So, you know, have at it. I don't know, just something. And and then even earlier in the film when she's called ice cold and she reacts the way any woman would act when, when they're called ice cold, um, you know, storming out of there. But yeah, just, you know, even though we don't get very much of her, uh, I genuinely liked both the character and the performance. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. She is very, very good. Um, all right. Well, let's let's uh, we've g- talked about some of these themes already, but I'll throw out a couple. Um, obviously, the the idea of uh, bullying being a you know uh, nurture kind of thing that it seems to exist you know across generations of these kids. Uh, I think it's interesting that the movie takes such a subtle approach to it yeah i mean the bullies are terrible but there's also those moments where you're like oh i understand why this kid's a complete shitball exactly yeah they they find a way to make the bullies moderately sympathetic here and and i, and I appreciate that because you know ultimately even though they you know they meet their eventual end uh, it, it wasn't something i was looking for it's not like i ever said oh that kid needs to die no i mean obviously once his older brother shows up and you know attempts murder then yeah, people got to die at that point. But, you know, I never wished death on any of them necessarily, you know, yeah, you know, bullies are bad and you know, they mess up your mental health and your, your psyche and things like that, your emotional health as well. But, you know, I would never wish death on a bully necessarily, at at least not as an adult. I'm sure I did multiple times as a child, but that's a different story. Um, But yeah, um, it's still, like I said, once uh, the older brother makes the decision to do what he's going to do, Ellie's hands are tied, ultimately. You know, Oscar's either going to drown or she's going to expose herself. And ultimately, she exposes herself fair and even leaves someone alive who didn't deserve to die. Not, not to say that everyone at the pool deserved to die, but I mean, anybody who was taking part in Oscar's drowning is going to meet their end. And, you know, ultimately, I, I can't fault Ellie for what she did. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, and as a viewer, it's really satisfying, you know. Oh, again, very discussed. cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there there is certainly this theme of, like, young love and first love and, and coming of mm-hmm. age. Um, but also because Oscar is bullied and ignored by his parents to a large degree and sidelined by his mother and father that you know we see that oh the what you would expect to be a a typical like coming of age romance is actually this warped and twisted thing Mm -hmm. and if and if his mother was around or his father was around then maybe somebody would be like hey how about you don't hang out with the creepy weird smelling girl (laughs) you know late into the night uh, well, when I mean, no if he around. had well-adjusted parents and, you know, a well-adjusted childhood, he would have had friends of his own. Ultimately, no matter how quiet or lame or, you know, whatever derogatory statement you want to come up with, no matter how much of that you are, it, it, there's always other people like you, it, it, especially if it's a big, big enough school. I, I'm not sure how big Oscar's school was. They never really gave us any kind of idea, but, it, you know, that pool looked pretty big, so it's probably a good-sized school. Um but yeah, just the, uh, I don't know, man, these, the, the, these, hmm. you've got me at a loss for words multiple times today. And that doesn't happen unless I'm talking about one of my favorite movies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I like it cause I'm never at a loss for words. Um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> the, the other big theme of, of the movie for me, uh, as I was watching the, the thing that kept resonating was again, this idea of um of of the tragedy of this romance like, or at least it one-sided though it may be it could it whether or not it is ever reciprocated by ellie that the last moment of this movie k- 
kind of tells you like, oh, this has all been leading to this point. Mm -hmm. And no matter what direction this relationship between Oscar and Ellie takes, it's going to end badly for Oscar. Uh, Honestly, it's probably going to end badly for both of them. Yeah. uh, Ultimately, because Ellie is a vampire in the body of a 12 year old, she needs a familiar more than any full grown vampire because, you know, she's she's not going to be able to take care of herself. She's not going to be able to get an apartment or, you know, do like the normal things that people do because she's so young. So she more than most vampires needs someone. And uh, that makes me want to, like I said, that makes me want to believe that she actually does have feelings for oscar ultimately if you take this movie at face value and just look at it as a romance coming of age film that's okay the movie is still spectacular if you just take it as that but if you do watch it as much as we have and you start to see these little clues here and there start to see little looks that ellie might give oscar you know depending on the situation uh it starts to change our view of it but ultimately whatever view of this movie you have, you're not incorrect. You know, this is very uh, subjective. If you look at this as a straight romance coming of age, awesome. Nothing wrong there. If you look at this as a wolf in sheep clothing, setting up her new familiar for the next 50 years, again, just as good. You know, you're, 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 you're going ahead and looking under the surface, which, you know, whether you do it or not, at least you watch the movie. You know, and that that's always the most important thing is that at least the movie was seen. Because this is a 2008 movie from Sweden, my fear was always that it was going to be underseen. Like when I first saw it, when it was brand new, my fear was that, oh, Americans don't like subtitles and they're not going to seek out a vampire movie that isn't ultra violent. You know, it's, it's you know, it, it's not one of the more violent vampire movies. Yes, there's a lot of blood. Don't get me wrong. It's not a bloodless movie by any stretch. But it is still one of the more tame um, movie uh, vampire movies as far as the violence goes. So, so yeah. I mean, either way that you take the movie, you're right. And I'm glad you watched it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, you know, if you've never seen Let the Right One In and you've just heard about it, it really is a movie that you just have to experience because it... And, I mean, we'll, we'll just kind of transition here into sort of final thoughts about the movie... Mm -hmm. it is not only is it just brilliantly directed and it looks gorgeous there is a somber mood to the movie that you know it it gets in your bones the way that the cold does you know where uh just right down to your core and i know like everybody's different there are going to be people who will tell you nothing ever happens in this movie it's stupid boring but (laughs) (laughs) Those people are not true cinephiles, I would argue. Uh, no, this is just yeah. one of those movies that captures, like a ro- like on its surface, it seems like a very straightforward kind of story of a young boy who befriends a vampire, and both of them are able to get what they need from the other, and it's it's sort of a happy ending where they mm-hmm. they find one another. Yeah, very it, symbiotic. Yeah. And if that's what you take away from the movie, then I would entreat you to think about what this relationship looks like when he is 25. (laughs) And then you start to kind of peel back why this movie is terrifying. And it's not, it's not terrifying because Ellie is a monster vampire. That's going to come get you at night. It's terrifying because this poor kid is doomed. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Ultimately, Ellie can never reciprocate the love that Oscar has for her. She can fake it, you know, um, but ultimately she has no genitals. So it's not like sex is going to be a thing. So, you know, you're talking about 25 year old Oscar. My question is how long until Oscar just gets sick of not being able to be physical with her and just decides, okay, she's just using me. Um, You know, is Oscar going to get taken out even earlier than we think? not because of his failures as a familiar, but more because he's sick of the situation. I mean, you know, that's always a possibility. Yeah. The future of Oscar and Ellie is just absolutely terrifying. I mean, that just the, the trail of bodies that they're probably going to leave all over Europe. And then the constant, you know, 
especially as Oscar gets older, the constant fear of Ellie wanting to move on or something or get a better familiar. You know, he he, he may not have seen what happened to Hawken, but he knows Hawken just disappeared one day. Yeah. So he should, in the back of his head, he should know, well, shit, that that's a possibility for me too. I could piss her off one day and she could snap my, snap my neck like a toothpick. And, you know, and I'm, and we're done. And, we're, and then she's back to square one. So, yeah, the, the ending, when you really sit down and think about this ending, that, that's why I said earlier, it's equal parts tragic and heartwarming. Because, yes, they both got what they want now. But like you said, what happens, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now when Oscar, you know, when Oscar's a 40-year-old virgin and he wants to date a girl, you know? Is, is Ellie going to go crazy? There, there's just so many possibilities for where this could have gone. And mind you, I'm not saying I want a sequel. I never, ever want a sequel to this movie. Please. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, <laughs> but, I, but just to, to think, just to think beyond the credits, it, it is absolutely terrifying for Oscar. Yeah. Yeah, like the world that exists beyond, you know, what you see in this movie, like that's that's the real terror of it to me is is like as soon as you start to buy into uh the the possibilities like 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 we were talking about either oscar becomes a murderer that's kind of best case um oscar is turned and now we've got two blood-sucking monsters on our hands (laughs) um oscar makes it for a while and then is murdered uh which is again maybe best case and or like oscar just gets fed up kills her that's a possibility i mean yeah. they're all of, but all of it ends in violence you know yeah that, exactly. like that that's the thing is that one of the things that this movie is kind of low-key about is that violence begets violence begets violence like oscar yeah you know he he is bullied and therefore you know wants to bully but can't because of his size when he finally gets the opportunity to whack a kid in the head he's certainly pleased with himself about it and oh, yeah. and and but the traje- the trajectory of all of these decisions is more and more violence and more and more destruction exactly about the only way that oscar is going to get away with his life when this whole thing is said and done is if he were to get caught harvesting blood but he gets caught in a country that doesn't have the death penalty. That would be about the only way, because you know they're going to blame him for all the murders, all the bodies that get found, you know, missing blood, blah, blah, blah. He's going to get, you know, if he gets caught in the act one day, he's going to get accused of doing all of them. He's going to spend the rest of his life in jail. But ultimately, that's one of the only ways I see Oscar, you know, surviving and growing old in this scenario, is if he gets caught in a country that doesn't have the death penalty. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the the only way out for Oscar, truly, is two seconds after the credits start rolling, he's like, "What the fuck am I doing?" and just throws the lid off of off of this casket, lets Ellie burn alive, and be like, "Hey, can you take me back? I need a return <laughs> ticket home. I need to I need to go home and and work some shit out with my parents." Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean. Uh... <laughs> As satisfying as that would be to watch, yeah, I, I don't think Oscar would have it in him. Not yet, anyway. No, 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 no. <laughs> he is he's he's too team Ellie at this point. Uh any anything else you want to say about the cause I, especially this being one of your favorites, I do not want to sell you short in any way on on properly filleting the film. I mean, yeah. Ultimately, what can I say about this movie? Brilliant screenplay by uh, John Lundquist, who also wrote the novel. Beautiful direction by Thomas Alfredson. The score by Johan Soderqvist. It's it's so subtle that you almost don't notice it throughout most of the movie. But a lot of like the um, kind of overtones of darkness that um, that Bo was talking about earlier comes directly from this score and. I've never noticed the score as much as I did on this last watch. It it is a beautiful, it's almost a Jerry Goldsmith type score in that it's very, uh, you know, sweeping melodies and, you know, big crescendos, but not too big, mind you, not like a Lord of the Rings type score. Uh, Yeah, I can't say enough good things about the score. It's so subtle and so beautiful. And then, I mean, the cinematography. Uh, Oh, God, I hope I pronounced this right. Hoyt van Hoytema is the uh, credited as the cinematographer, and 
I mean, this movie, there are shots in this film that I would frame and put up on my wall. There are, so, and yes, I include Burning Virginia in that, mm-hmm. <laughs> in that list. That shot is stellar. But I mean, there, the shot of Ellie going up the building, there's a shot of uh, Ellie sitting on top of the jungle gym there. I think it's the second night yeah, that yeah, they've yeah. met. And, and then Oscar walks into the frame from the right side. That shot is gorgeous. The the way that the camera is kind of panning towards the side of the screen that Oscar's going to come out of. Just it's just framed so beautifully. And I mean, I've got countless examples of that. There are so many examples of beautiful cinematography in this movie. And then finally. I am a big fan of movies that are edited by their director. I I think a director, no one knows more than the the director what he wants, what his vision is. So the fact that he's also the editor on this film, uh, just I I think it's an absolute triumph. And one of the big reasons why it is an absolute triumph is because the director edited this as well. So yeah, wonderful job from Thomas Alfredson. Uh, I can't say as much about the rest of his career, unfortunately. He's done some good stuff, but oh my god, he did The Snowman, which was literally one of my lowest rated movies of 2018. I absolutely hated that film. And I was so excited going into it because, you know, it's the director of, you know, my favorite vampire movie. It, it's got to be at least watchable, right? Nope. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he ought to take the uh, the Lena Lee Anderson approach. You do the the big one, you do a couple of other things, <laughs> just just to you know flex the muscles a little bit, and and then you call it a day. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, but it, like I said, as far as the movie, I mean, what can I what what else can I say? Perfect score, cinematography, acting, editing, um, just just I mean. It, the movie is two hours long and does not feel two hours to me, even though there are a lot of slow scenes. As Bo mentioned, there are a lot of, you know, terrible cinephiles out there who say this film is boring or that very little happens. It's like, I mean, come on, a woman bursts into flame in her hospital bed. I mean, that's that alone should satisfy, you know, some uh, gore, hound, maybe not gore hounds, but, you know, horror fanatics in general. But yeah, to say that this movie is quote unquote slow it's a little bit of a misnomer. I mean, yeah, just because there's not a whole lot of action and we don't see Ellie kill every single person that she kills in the film, um, the artistic uh, vision there, it, it, it's just perfect in every way. Like I said, I, this movie is beyond a 10 out of 10 for me. I don't, I, and I don't throw that score around lightly. I know I said that for Psycho as well, but I mean, it's Psycho for God's sakes. And now sure. here we are again. <laughs> it's let the right one in. I mean, Th- that's... there is... That's my secret plan is to only get you in for movies that are so good. You have to score in it. And that way, everyone's going to be like, you know what? Jerry is, is great on the show, but he just gives everything a five out of five. There you go. Uh, yeah. And apparently uh, everything that Dun- every show that Duncan has me on is movies that I hate because <laughs> I've, I've what have I reviewed with Duncan now? Halloween, uh, the, the second Rob Zombie Halloween. And I forget the other movie that was also terrible. But, I mean, granted, it's not like I don't like talking about bad movies. Sometimes those conversations could be just as fun as this one. But, I mean, let me tell you, folks, I have had an ear-to-ear grin on my face this entire episode. We're we're coming up on two hours now, and I could still talk about this movie for another hour or two. I mean, when I say it is my favorite vampire movie, it's not hyperbole. It's not lip service. It is... And, and nothing is even close. Not Bram Stoker, not Lost Boys, not, you know, any other vampire movie you could think of. Uh, just none of them come close to, to this. And for me, yes, um, even though my opinions on Ellie's motivation has changed over the years, on the surface, this is a beautiful film about two young people discovering feelings that maybe they've never had before. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's honestly... I hate romance. I hate film romance. I, I, it's just not something that I gravitate towards. This is without a doubt my favorite film, quote unquote, romance. Because, like I said, as the years have gone along, I'm seeing it more as a one sided romance. But Bo also made a lot of great points tonight that are making me see the other side of the spectrum again. Because, you know, I, I've, I've kind of had tunnel vision the last like five or so years with this film of, you know, Ellie is a wolf in sheep's clothing. But legitimately, 
I feel like any vampire has to have some kind of emotion for their familiar. You know, I mean, they're, they're not going to hate their familiar. This person is the one that's going to be doing everything for you, you know, while the sun is out, feeding you, keeping you out of trouble, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, there, I, I would imagine there's a certain amount of emotionality that goes with the vampire familiar relationship. But the fact that these two are at least perceivably the same age and just the fact that it seems like they're both discovering feelings that they're not 100% used to, especially Ellie, because, I mean, let us not forget, Ellie is Elias, and yeah. she still seems to genuinely care for Oscar. Um, so it's definitely not a sex thing or a physical thing. You know, they're, they're legitimate emotion there. Um, part of the problem I always have with romance, uh, you know, in films is that the physical is a part of it. And it's like, yeah, you could look at a woman and she looks good and you imagine yourself having sex with her. And, you know, you, you know, it goes on from there with this because there was no physical involved. It's literally one of the most pure film romances I've ever seen. And yeah, without a doubt, my favorite vampire movie ever. Excellent. I also uh, would give this movie a perfect score. Yep. Uh, you know, a solid five stars out of me. Um, oh, yeah. it is, yeah, I mean, it's truly one of the, the great modern horror films and, uh, I am a bit beholden to Fright Night as a vampire sure. film. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it does a lot of things right for me, but that's also like the campier, sillier version of, you know, mm -hmm. that subgenre. Like this is the classy one. Like if you want to, <laughs> if you want to get dressed up and go to a movie, this is what you go to. Um, yeah, it's. I yeah. mean, it's a brilliant film. It. Uh, it. It. We've. We've said uh, a lot about them. So let's get to three things that you, as a listener, may not know about. Let the right one in. I'll be curious if Jerry uh, also does not know these things. But um, so uh, this one, uh, a couple of these are more technical in nature. But I, you know, kind of enjoy that stuff myself. Uh, for sound effects for this movie, Jerry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, by the way, um, for those who don't know, I actually uh, do have a bachelor's degree in audio production, and I used to work in Foley. So I, I, I know where Bo is going, and yes, uh, I love it. <laughs> so to, to replicate the sounds of, of tearing into flesh, they used biting into sausages. <laughs> the blood drinking was done by drinking yogurt. And when they, when you hear the sounds of blinking in the movie, uh, it was the the sound captured was grape skins being rubbed together. Mm -hmm. uh, all of which I find uh, fascinating. I, I like good Foley stuff. Like Barbarian Sound Studio oh, is terrific just wonderful. because that is a movie where you can get lost in. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. How? What are they using the broccoli for? <laughs> um, almost every scene number two almost every scene in this movie has a splash of the color red somewhere in it hmm. I didn't realize that so the the next time you're watching it look for nice. like in, in sometimes it's just in the corners or whatever but almost uh -huh. not every scene almost every scene has a uh, red or red orange uh, very in, cool in the in the color palette um, also uh, one thing I did not know until I read this, and then it blew my damn mind. Late into the production of the film, Lena Leanderson's voice was replaced with a uh, a more androgynous sounding voice because her voice was rather high. Mm -hmm. And so an actress uh, named Elif Salen was then chosen because she had a more androgynous sound in her voice. And it made, uh, as the the sound designer per Sundstrom said, uh, it made uh, Ellie seem more threatening in the film. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So three things you may not know. Hopefully, ladies and jelly spoons, you are leaving this show uh, excited for Let the Right One In. If you haven't seen it in a long time, I hope I hope this inspires you to go back and rewatch it, and maybe even a little smarter. Uh, about some of the uh, the thematic and technical elements of the movie that you can uh, take with you to enjoy on your uh, your journey through the film again. Um, <laughs> look, I always have a blast talking to you, sir. It, oh, love it. 
it, it is always a good time. Uh, we recently talked about the movie Them. That was super fun as well. Yes. Uh, so uh, I know people are going to want to listen to a lot more out of you because I know I do. Um, <laughs> where can people <laughs> find such a thing? All right. So uh, my three main shows are all under the No More Room in Hell banner. There is the main show just called No More Room in Hell. Um, that latest episode, which is still technically our Halloween episode, uh, we looked at 1972's Season of the Witch, directed by Mr. George A. Romero, and um, 2013's Witchin' and Bitchin' out of Spain by director Alex de la Iglesias. Um, we will be recording a new episode this coming weekend. We're going to be, as November is Italian Horror Month, of course, we're going to be looking at a couple of... Uh, Italian horror films. Uh, the titles actually escape my mind right now. Oh, one of them is Graveyard Disturbance. Yeah, that's right. One of them is Graveyard Disturbance, and I forget the other one. I haven't actually watched my movies yet, uh, but that'll be our next episode. Probably will be out sometime around Thanksgiving. On um, It's Not Horror, okay. We finally ended our hiatus for October. And we came back to do triumphantly to do 1981's Dragon Slayer. That is a oh, um, and what a great movie! Oh, so underrated. And and the fact that during the commentary that we did for the film, for those who don't know, it's not horror. Okay, is a commentary show. It's just movie commentaries. Um, but yeah, half the people on the episode, it was their first time watch, and I just I feel so bad because. When you're doing a commentary, you're not catching all the dialogue. You're not catching all the plot points. You know, you're trying to feed information to the listeners and, you know, trying to be somewhat entertaining, blah, blah, blah. So a couple of the people on the show actually were not ultra happy with the movie. And yeah, I wanted to leap through the Internet and slap them. But yeah, Dragon Slayer is an underrated gem. I, I think it came out right around the same time as Excalibur. And I think Excalibur just kind of buried it because that film, you know, that was a big Oscar dominated film, blah, 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 that came out right around the same time. Um, and then Dragon Slayer, of course, having an animatronic dragon in it uh, made by Buena Vista, which, of course, is a Disney company. Um, maybe people at the time, you know, didn't take it too seriously, thought it was more of a family film than, you know, the, a dark, uh, you know, dragon slaying film as it was. But yeah, if you have not seen Dragon Slayer, I definitely recommend it. Fun little movie. Uh, and for 1981, uh, a gorgeous dragon, an absolutely beautiful dragon for 1981. Um, it is a mix of animatronic and stop motion. So you're going to be dealing with both. Uh, some of the stop motion, obviously, it's 1981, doesn't look awesome. But, I mean, the animatronic stuff just looks beautiful. So, yeah, again, check it out if you haven't. Uh, what else do I got? In the Mike of Madness uh, is back after a very long hiatus with Rebecca Reinhardt um, doing all of her independent film projects that she does in the horror community. Uh, we did an, we did a tribute to 1981 where we basically came up with 15 categories and just uh, you know awarded each category to a film from 1981. So of course you know if you know anything about Rebecca and I, you know we are both Friday the 13th stands. So you know obviously Friday the 13th Part Two is very well represented on that show. But we also talk a lot about a lot of underrated, more underrated stuff like Happy Birthday to Me, The Burning. Um, and not that my bloody Valentine is underrated, but you know, at least the uncut version is since a lot of people haven't seen the uncut version. In fact, my favorite kill from 1981 comes from my, the uncut version of my bloody Valentine, which, you know, that's a story for another podcast though. So check that out on in the mic of madness and underwater Kaiju from outer space finally has released a new episode. We actually released it in September, but we, or excuse me, we actually recorded it in September, but we decided not to release it in October because of the glut of all the Halloween and horror podcasts that were going to get released. So we finally released it this week. Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space is, of course, you know, our uh, Kaiju, you know, Japanese monster uh, podcast with Jerry Herring from Kill the Cast. On the latest episode, we looked at uh, Gamera versus Burrigan, and we continue our episodic retrospective of the original Ultraman series. So if you're into kaiju stuff, check out that. That, uh, unfortunately, is my only podcast that actually appears on the Legion Podcast Network. All my other shows are available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network or wherever 
you catch your podcast. And I think that's it for me. I also have some guest spots here. Uh, I did a bite sized cinema recently. I did a cut to the chase recently. Ultimately, if you put every podcast that's on the Dark Discussions uh, network on a dartboard and you throw a dart at it, it's it's 50-50 that I'm going to be on that show. So go ahead. <laughs> I, that That's also a fun drinking game, I find. There you go. <laughs> it's just like I'm going to I'm going to Google a movie and then Dark Discussions. And if Jerry's <laughs> name is there, I take a shot. <laughs> there you go. Uh, oh yeah but fun 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 yeah fun as always my friend this was great i i I love this i don't usually record on uh this particular night of the week so um it's nice to kind of you know flex my muscles a little bit and and just for the first time get to talk about one of my favorite films ever so yeah again thank you so much oh man thank you uh all right well that's enough of that for now Uh, (laughs) i'll be right back to close out the show thanks man And there you have it. There is the discussion with uh, Jerry Cortez. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I certainly enjoyed it a whole lot. Uh, So, coming next uh, week is going to be a discussion with Lee Russell all about Let Me In, the remake of Let the Right One In. And it's uh, it's a terrific conversation, I thought. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy hearing us discuss the differences between these two movies And also how Let Me In is sort of much maligned, but maybe not as bad as you remember uh, or have heard. So at any rate, I won't spoil that conversation, but it was a really good one. And I think you're going to have a good time with it. So anyway, thanks as always for listening to uh, The Dark Parade. Uh, This is the point where I beg you, please rate and review the show on the podcast catcher of your choice. If you can drop by Apple uh, iTunes and leave us a five star review there. It helps with the profile of the show show a whole bunch. Uh, I'm very proud of the discussions that we host on the, on this show. I hope you're enjoying it. So uh, if you are enjoying it, please uh, then leave a review. Uh, and and honestly, the best thing you can do is just uh, you know to your friends and on your social media channels and so forth. Uh, just kind of s- share the show, spread the word, let people know that you're enjoying it. And uh, that they might enjoy it as well. So, at any rate, here we are. We are back in the saddle now. Uh, in December, uh, we've got some good stuff coming. And uh, not only do we have Let Me In coming next week, the next few movies are planned out, and I think we're going to have a real good time uh, discussing those. So, I don't, I don't know if I've said it yet. I'm not going to spoil it here, but I may have spoiled it somewhere else. I don't know. Things happen, and I can't remember all the time. Anyway. Uh, Have a great rest of the week, everybody. We'll see you back here uh, for a Sinister Sunday. We'll be coming uh, this very week. So uh, tune in on uh, youtube.com forward slash Legion podcasts at 5 p.m. Central time. If you want to uh, join the the live program where we talk about news and some streaming movies and various things, whatever kind of comes up in the chat and sometimes... Not sometimes, all the time. The best part about it is when somebody says something goofy in chat and we just go off on a tangent about it. And uh, it, it's it's terrific. It's a lot of fun. So we will be back with that very, very soon. That's it for this time. Thanks, as always, uh, for being part of the Dark Parade. See you later. See you later.